Hi, everyone. Welcome to Spoiler Peace Theater, the podcast that doesn't give a shit about spoilers. We just want to talk about the movies. My name is Dave Riedel. My Dave Riedel, as I just said. My name is Dave Riedel. <laughs> My pronouns are he, him. I write about movies, and I'm a member of the Boston Online Film Critics Association. My name is Evan Crean. My pronouns are he, him, co-chair of the Boston Online Film Critics Association, and co-author of your 80s movie guide to better living. And my name is Megan Kearns. My pronouns are she, her. I write film reviews for Edge Media Network, and I, too, am a member of the Boston Online Film Critics Association. Yep, you are. Huzzah! Um, mm-hmm. Huzzah! I love huzzah. So much better mm-hmm. than hooray. Me too, uh, me too. So on the show this week, we're going to talk about three movies. But before we get to that, just want to plug our Patreon right quick. Uh, it's the end of the month. It was poll time in which we uh, have our patrons vote on a movie for us to watch. Um, we chose films that it's Black History Month, so we chose films with largely black casts. And the choices were Two, Love and Basketball, Brown Sugar, Way to Excel, and Fast Color. And our patrons chose Love and Basketball. So we talk about that extensively over on Ye Old Patreon. We had a lot of fun. For five simple bones a month, you too could become a member and have access to more than 200 bonus episodes. We should actually count how many there are sometime and just say like, there's 4,000. There aren't. (laughs) (laughs) So anyway, that's going on over there. And thank you very much, patrons. Um, We had a lot of fun talking about it and we hope you all have a good time listening. The three movies on tonight's show, we are going to be talking about Hellbender, Studio 666, and Kimmy. Um... (laughs) I don't know why I said it that way, but maybe I have South Park on the brain. I don't know. (laughs) First movie of the night. Let's get into Hellbender, which is a great name for a movie. Mm -hmm. For sure. This is written and directed by John Adams, Zelda Adams, and Toby Poser. And it stars Toby Poser and Zelda Adams and Lulu Adams. A lot of people named Adams. Um, I guess they're a filmmaking... Adams family. Yes, they are a family <laughs> of filmmakers and musicians. They are actually musicians too, right? I think so. I think I read that. And anyway, <laughs> the one sentence IMDb description of this is amazing. So here it is. A lonely teen discovers her family's ties to witchcraft. Boy, That's tra- true. boy does she. I mean, <laughs> not wrong. <laughs> and and let me just say, you know, spoiler alert. Yes. Ties to witchcraft. I mean, we learn the ties to witchcraft, I think, in the opening scene. Mm-hmm. Because the there's, I, I guess we're back in the past in some point. I don't know where we are, when we are, I should say. Um, but they're hanging a witch. And the witch is like, not nah, not being hung. So, because the, foot, <laughs> the foot's twitching. Bags over the witch's head. And it looks like she's been hanged and she's dead. And then the foot starts to twitch. And then it twitches some more. And then a woman pulls out a revolver, which makes me think that it's not the 17th century because there weren't revolvers until mid-19th century, but that's okay. Takes a bunch of shots at the witch's head, and the witch is like, fuck you, and then flies into the air like Neo at the end of the Matrix. (laughs) Right. Like a flaming torpedo. Yeah. (laughs) Or a missile, rather. Torpedoes are underwater. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, So that's what happens. And then we're in the present day, and we're in, are we in upstate New York? Is that where we are? Um, yes. There's a mom and her teenage daughter, and they're in a band. And mom plays bass, and the daughter plays drums, and um, uh, and it's uh, some decent music, I have to say. And then mom's like, "I'm going to town. Do you need anything?" And the kid says, "I want to come with you." And mom says, "Nope," because mom has told the kid that she has like a fatal autoimmune disease. And she says, all right, can you get me some drumsticks? And then, you know, mom goes to town and the townsfolk are like, blah, blah, you look familiar. And she's like, I am not the woman you think I am. As if she's, you know, saying these are not the droids you're looking for. Um, (laughs) And then just a whole bunch of stuff starts to happen. Like a guy wanders onto their property and he's like hiking and he's lost. And he runs into the daughter whose name is, um, hold on. Izzy. Izzy. Thank you. (laughs) Mom's name is Mother by the way, according to the credits. And um, Izzy's like, I can't talk to you because I'm sick. And he's like, oh, okay. Um, Well, anyway, I just live on the other side of the mountain. And so does my niece. Her name's Amber. You guys should probably be friends because you're roughly the same age. It's like, well, that's an interesting thing to say, lost guy, but okay. And then mom shows up and she's like, get out of here, Izzy. And then she turns the guy into dust. (laughs) 
<laughs> well, she asks if he's married and has kids first. Right. And then she looks really sad about turning him to dust. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. But she also samples his blood and seems to learn some, in my opinion, seems to learn something disturbing about him that causes her to carry out her plan. <laughs> oh, do you think that's what it yeah. is? I think it was. I kind of got that she tasted the blood, saw something evil, and was like, well, fuck this guy. <laughs> oh, see, I just figured she was like, all right, not married, no kids, no one's going to miss him. That's what I thought, too. Yeah. And then things from there just get, you know, Izzy is at the age where she's like, I fucking want to meet some people my age. Jesus. And so she goes on a lot of walks around the property and she accidentally on purpose stumbles <laughs> on uh, somebody else's house. And it turns out Amber is there and you think it's Amber's house. This is the, the girl that the hiker mentioned, by the way. Um, but it turns out she's kind of squatting at the pool. Um, I guess is the best way to describe it because it's what it looks like a weekend house for some rich asshole and his family. And so they go for a swim and Amber's like, we should be pals. And as he's like, totally after her initial trepidation. And um, then Izzy gets invited to a party that Amber's having at the house, not knowing of course that she's squatting by the way. I think she, well, Maybe does she know that when did they when does Amber like hey I'm squatting here when when, when does that happen she says that on the first is visit. it the first one so Izzy knows what's going on yeah okay so so then they're having a party it's Izzy and Amber and two other people that she meets and they're they're doing shots or they're doing something and then Izzy eats a worm and then she has a taste for human flesh sort of <laughs> yeah well the interesting thing is that she's vegetarian so she's never had meat before. Mm. And mm -hmm. very similar to uh, Julia DeCornaz Raw, also a vegetarian, the minute it has meat, everything changes. Yeah. Like, <laughs> right. Becomes cannibalistic. Yeah. She kind of goes into this <laughs> trance and just like wants to start eating everything that looks remotely meat like. Yes. And does. And uh, long story short, she kills Amber in a cave made out of meat. So, oh wow, yeah, you jumped some steps. I yeah. did. Yeah, you really, you really jumped from there. But yeah, but I you're would not say wrong. no. That's accurate. That just happened. I would say the diverging piece when it comes to this versus Raw is that there is like a magical explanation for why this happens to her when she eats. We find out she eats a living being. It's fear. <laughs> The fear in its blood like supercharges her and makes her more powerful. And so she kind of like keeps upping the ante by eating different things and like kind of testing the boundaries. And her mom initially is upset about it, but then kind of is like, you know, I should maybe explain some of this stuff to you. And then they kind of delve deeper into what's going on. Um, but things get kind of spiral out of control, as they mentioned. Yeah. Well, then Izzy, well, yeah. Izzy kind of goes full like, Verge of evil witch, you know, if we're going to use the mo movie's terminology, uh, which is to say. Well, actually, that's what's interesting is the movie's terminology is Hellbender, not witch. Right, right. You're <laughs> correct. They call themselves Hellbenders, which is also the name of their band. Yes. Um, but it's so interesting when Izzy is explaining that to the park ranger who comes by and he's like, what What the heck's a Hellbender? And she's like, well, it's kind of like a witch meets a demon. Meets, you know, and it's, yeah. So it's yeah. interesting. But is, I, I you know. Does somebody else want to take over and just sort of explain the, you know, the goings on? Because I feel like I have strong opinions that might not have be totally in line with what the narrative's trying to say. So somebody help me out. <laughs> I'm not sure what else we need to explain. Okay, well, yeah. that, I mean, that is pretty much it. It just sort of gets darker and darker until mom finds the cave of, I mean, what is that like tunnel made out of? Is it innards, flesh, meat? What is that? All um, of the above. All of the above. <laughs> yeah. It's her happy place, as she tells her Oh, mom. my God. Right. When she said that, I was like, this is your happy place? Well, wow. <laughs> yeah. I mean, but that is the really interesting and fascinating point of contention between the two leads is that mom is all about kind of the cool aspects of magic, but for the most part is benevolent, doesn't want to hurt anyone, doesn't want to hurt any any creature, talks about, you know, the power of nature and everything, and has taught Izzy to be really loving and kind. And Izzy, the minute she gets a taste of power, is like, what else can I eat? I want to eat this. I want to eat that. What about people? What about people? You must feel so much power. And like, she's just like power hungry and just yeah. doesn't give a fuck about anyone. And it's, it's a very interesting dichotomy. Yeah. And it happens like mm -hmm. instantly. 
um, the moment she eats that worm. And the other thing is, is like Izzy basically tells her mother at the end, she's like, well, I'm really powerful now. And so I'm going to make the conscious choice not to kill you. And I'm going to town. Do you need anything? And her mom's like, yeah, bass strings. <laughs> and I was yeah. just like, well, isn't this the old <laughs> how do you do? I mean, mm-hmm. it's, it's the old like role reversal. I would not say this movie is subtle, but that doesn't mean anything other than it's not subtle. Um, I, I thought it was kind of a hoot. Also creepy, though. Effectively creepy in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. Um, like crawling into the tunnel of meat there at the end. I was just like, <laughs> oh my God, oh my God, it's a tunnel of meat. Oh my God. But it's also very vaginal and womb-like, which is interesting for the mom to be doing that. Like, yeah. It's, it's very much a reversal. Well, and it's I, interesting. Izzy says something to the effect, I, you two correct me if I'm wrong. She says something like, I don't want to have a child yet, so I'm not going to eat you. Did I make yes. that up? She does say that. No, that's mm-hmm. correct. That's okay. how they procreate because they can, they can have... Or Genesis, like they can have give birth on their own, but yeah, but you need to kill the mother first. Yeah, so it's just kind of like you feel like mom's going to be looking over her shoulder for the rest, well, forever, because I <laughs> you all because I don't think that they die until they are killed by one of their own. Right. Um, yeah, well, I think that's that expression they keep saying over and over again about the seasons eating yeah. each other. Yep. <laughs> right. Exactly. Um. So anyway, I mean, I don't think there's a lot to say about it, except that, I mean, it's super low budge, but they do, they do a lot with it. Um, mm-hmm. The special effects are a little corny, but that's fine. Um, I mean, there's, uh, you're looking at this movie and being like, this movie costs three cents. So it's amazing it looks as good as it does. Um, I think that's also why so much of it takes place outdoors. Um, I would guess, because this is a family of filmmakers who have made several films before, I would not be surprised that these are their own homes they're shooting in. So, you know, what did you guys think of the acting overall? I thought it was good. I really enjoyed this movie. Um, I really dug it. I think you both know that sometimes if a movie gets kind of weird or goes weird <laughs> places, I don't always love it, but I actually really liked it in this instance. I liked the hallucinogenic scenes and the, the visions and seeing the different powers, like the power about being able to put your hand over a symbol and have like a key pop out through your hand. That was cool <laughs> and gross. Um, or ha- putting so, your hand over the book and then like seeing the visions of where someone is or what their memories are. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. So I just, I thought that was all really well integrated into the plot and I thought it looked really good too while it was doing those kind of weird trippy hallucinations but also there was just some good cinematography generally i think there were some really kind of sharp looking single shots like one of my favorites was when the mom is sitting at the top of the stairs in front of the door eating i guess we find out later she's eating maggots out of that teapot (laughs) Mm -hmm. i don't remember um yeah it's her special stash (laughs) Right. They have to eat the maggots because the maggots taste are are birthed from death. So they get like even more (laughs) deathiness and power in them. So I don't know. I really dug this. I I think I thought the acting was good. I thought the the mother and the daughter dynamic felt believable. And honestly, after watching this movie and finding out that this is a family that made it, it made it even more endearing to me. (laughs) I just thought it was really cool that a family made this together. This is a real mother and daughter. I think that lent authenticity to it. And I like the music too. I think the music was well integrated. And I did too. Songs that they sing that are related to the plot. (laughs) Yeah, I agree. I agree with all that actually. Um, I think there was a lot of inventive camera work for what they had to work with. Um, which I think is, you know, kind of, you know, when you don't have a lot of money, you do, you, you like, you try to like do cool shit <laughs> to, to make up for that. If you're inventive, which these people clearly are, because, um, I've never seen a movie quite like this with this sort of story. I don't know. Maybe you two have, but, um, mm-hmm. this is, this is unique to me. Um, so anyway, um, Megan is uh, what what did you have to say aside from what we've already said? Um <laughs> maybe it's some of the same. We'll see. <laughs> ah. I I really liked this too. Um I think like you said Dave it really maximizes its low budget. I think it's very tense, very creepy. 
like you, Evan, I really like the two lead performances. I think Zelda Adams and Toby Poser are really good. Unfortunately, I think Lulu Adams, who plays Amber, is terrible. Um, and some of the other supporting uh, actors are not good. But I think the two leads are really great, especially Izzy. I really like her tremendously. Um, I also enjoyed the mother-daughter dynamics. I enjoyed the exploration of witchcraft and nature and the intersection of the two. And I, you know, I already mentioned that this is in its premise solely. It's very similar to Ra, but there, there are quite a few films that look at kind of a burgeoning sexual awakening or kind of a first period after having some kind of supernatural thing, you know, like Raw, Ginger Snaps, these kinds of films where there's something happens that kind of triggers this kind of awakening or this kind of hunger um, that's allegorical or metaphorical for something else. And yeah, I really, so even though I've seen this story before or this premise, I really liked it. I thought it explored it in a really interesting way. I always love explorations of power dynamics. And it's really intriguing to see a teen who is really power hungry, like getting a taste for the first time. So I liked that too. Mm -hmm. And I really, I think that Toby Poser as the mom does a really great job showing her love and her care for her daughter, but also her fear. She is petrified. Like, what the hell? Who is this person? This is not the person I raised. This is not who I thought that Izzy was. And that is all over her face and her body language. And I think it's really expressed very effectively. So I really enjoyed this. Yeah, I did too. Yeah, I think it, it, everything's kind of explained in that 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 power dynamic switch at the end with I'm going to town, what do you need? Bass strings. It's just like, oh, okay. <laughs> we know who's in charge now. Um, mm -hmm. Right. And it's just a funny, you know, switch in tone because up until that, it's been a pretty terrifying scene of mom is holding a lantern and she's in this dark cave like space where she can't see anything and she keeps dropping the lantern. And it's just, it's so spooky that that have her be like, yeah, bass drinks. <laughs> it's such a funny, yeah. it's just kind of switch in tone and it, it's effective, I think. Yeah, for sure. It's also really disturbing how she's, at least we see in the vision that she, that Izzy has been eating Amber. <laughs> like yeah. her innards are exposed and then like her mm -hmm. face deflates later. Oh, it's yeah, it's gross, but it's really well done. Yeah. Yeah. Amber, who is uh, Izzy's real life sister. So yes, did mention that it's, it really is their entire family in this movie more or less. So I think uh, that's so cute. Yeah. Um, like why not? If you know what you're doing and you, everybody in your family can act, go ahead. You know, so uh, well, except in in your opinion, Lulu yes. Adams. <laughs> <laughs> in my opinion, they can't all act, but uh, I mean, I've seen worse performances. Yeah. So I, I mean, I, I I thought Lulu was only so so too, but I agree with you both that mom and daughter, mom and Izzy are really good. Um, yes. And anyway, that's Hellbender. Unless anybody has final thoughts, yay, nay. Hmm. I mean, I, I really enjoyed some of the dialogue too. Like one of my favorite moments was when um, <laughs> Izzy says, "I'm dangerous to who?" and her mom corrects her um. <laughs> to who. <whom. laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. Megan, any parting thoughts for you? Nope, said everything I wanted to say. All righty. Well, let's move on to our second horror question mark movie of the night. Uh, studio 666 666 sorry I said it the wrong way <laughs> supposed to say it with a demonic voice this is um, the Foo Fighters <laughs> horror movie for lack of a better way to describe it the IMDB one sentence summary is legendary rock band Foo Fighters move into an Encino mansion steeped in grisly rock and roll history to record their much anticipated 10th album that is true uh, directed by BJ McDonald story by Dave Grohl Screenplay by Jeff Bueller and Rebecca Hughes, starring Dave, starring Foo Fighters in particular, Dave Grohl, mm -hmm. Whitney Cummings, uh, Jeff Garland, Will Forte, Will Forte, and um, yeah, and basically that's what happens. The Foo Fighters have to record this album, and their manager Jeff Garland, who you find out later is a Satanist, recommends that they uh, <laughs> use this house where um, 
a band leader uh, murdered everybody in his band with a hammer and then hanged himself from the second story. And uh, there's like a book that's right out of the Evil Dead in the basement that controls everything and like a raccoon carcass that they like drain blood from for use that, that I should say that the other band guy who is dead but is also a ghost sort of demon thing living around there. And what happens eventually is uh, Dave Grohl gets possessed and he gets obsessed about recording this epic song, which ends up being like 32 minutes or something like that. (laughs) And um, the way this prophecy is fulfilled that rock and roll will become huge again is that this song will be the biggest song ever. And that will like solidify Satan's grip over music and um, in the process, Dave Grohl kills all the other members of the Foo Fighters <laughs> in some horrific ways, and Whitney Cummings, um, and Will Forte, and um, then becomes a very successful solo artist. <laughs> so that's that's the entire plot in a nutshell. Mm-hmm. Um, I that is. I didn't love this. I didn't hate it. Um, I thought it had its moments. I, this is what I'll say. It's a good thing Dave Grohl is as charismatic as he is. Because the only other Foo Fighter acting wise who is even remotely charismatic is Taylor Hawkins. And then Pat Smear sort of just because he always looks like he's about to laugh. Um, mm-hmm. But all of the other members of the band, I don't know if you felt the same way I did, but they killed in order of acting ability. Like the worst actor got killed first, and then the next worst actor, worst actor got killed. And then, so by the end, Nate and Pat Smear, who are a little bit better than the other ones, are the two that are still left alive until you can see it coming a mile away that Pat Smear is going to get run over by that van. But anyway, what do y'all think? I thought... <laughs> I mean, you know, it's it's okay. I mean, gang. Uh, I hated this. It was a slog. I'm not gonna lie. I I used to be able to say I would watch the Foo Fighters in anything, <laughs> but after seeing this movie, I can no longer say that. <laughs> yeah, this is a an hour and forty eight minutes. This is a forty five minute idea that they've added an hour onto. Woof. <laughs> yeah, that's so to to have a 45 minute idea including credits and then to add an hour onto it. That's I mean it's a lot. It just keeps going. Like at the point where you're like, "Okay, the story could be resolved." It's like, "Nope, we're going to watch Dave Grohl and Jeff Garwin kick each other in the nuts repeatedly for like 10 minutes." <laughs> yeah. And you know that that was in Dave Grohl's treatment and ended up in the final screenplay. Um Ugh. Well, any the film is so bad. <laughs> any film that has the scintillating dialogue of it's like you were constipated and you just took the biggest musical shit. <sighs> it's not a great line yeah, of dialogue. It's horrendous. It's like yeah. there was a movie I saw a number of years ago at the the Boston Sci Fi Film Festival, and I can't even remember the name of it. But like the dialogue reminded me of you know, like when kids realize they can get away with swearing, and their parents. <laughs> aren't around or can't hear them or whatever. Some of the dialogue in this movie feels like that. People are like, it's going to blow your own dick out through your mouth. And Jeff Garland's like, I don't even know what that means. And yeah, I don't either. It's dumb. Mm -hmm. It's just people saying dicks and balls and shits and fucks because they can and they think it's funny, but it's not. It's really not funny. And this movie occupies such a weird space between being a a horror comedy and being a real horror movie because it's like pretty gory. It's There's so like, violent. It's so it's violent. Over the top. So it's like pick a lane. Like either be really funny and not that you can't have gore in a funny movie but you need to be a lot fucking funnier <laughs> to be a horror comedy. Uh, Evan, yes. Evan just uh, said or, a lot fucking funnier. I want to just say that. <laughs> Break in there. Go ahead. This film is not funny at all. Right. I'm just, well, Evan is getting impassioned so I'm just... <laughs> Making a You're note noting of it. it. Yeah. Yeah. It's just a dud. It really is. It's just poorly written. The dialogue's bad. It's just 
it's unfocused yeah. and uh, it's just disappointing because I think there are the bones of a good idea here. If they had really leaned into the comedy or, and been funny, or if they really leaned into it being a serious horror movie, like I could be on board with that. And if, and if it was a serious horror movie that wasn't so derivative of other things where you're just like, okay, evil dead i get it okay the blood and the light bulb yeah. we get it you like evil dead well also <laughs> they, they did the exorcist like when when max von Sydow, when um when will forte shows up the first time with the delivery it's the exorcist but it's like not really nighttime and the light's not bright enough and he's in the wrong place in the frame and it's like i think they're doing the exorcist but i'm not really sure also i just want to mention that this house has been the exterior anyway. I don't know about the interior. The exterior has been the exterior of a million homes in a million movies. And I found that really distracting. Um, I also was distracted by uh, the pacing, which was just all over the place. Um, I agree with you both that the dialogue sucked, but after a while, I just was like, I didn't give a shit because it was just like, I was just waiting for the movie to end. Um, I also thought it was weird that they didn't really seem to, this is, I spent a lot of time thinking about the production of the album because I know a lot about producing records. And I was like, why is the engineer who's John Carpenter, by the way, why is the engineer only here for like a day? (laughs) You know, where's the engineer, the Mm -hmm. other like six weeks that they're recording this album. Um, There's that. And then I was thinking to myself, you know, the one thing that this movie kind of gets right is band dynamics, because there's a point when they're all standing in the living room and Dave Grohl is giving them a pep talk and they all, it's early in the movie and they all get on board. But uh, I think it's Nate, the bassist. He's like, yeah, let's do it. Taylor, get behind the drums. And he goes, fuck you, Nate. Don't tell me what to do. And it's like, that is such a thing that you would hear in a band that that made me think, okay, so these people at least know what a band is like. But so much of it is just... I'm going to take back what I said and and say that it was okay and say, yeah, it's kind of bad. Yeah, I... I I like... I apologize, Megan. This was my idea, too. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. I despised this. This might be one of the worst movies I've ever seen. And not just because it's bad, because I was looking at it and I was like, oh, the cinematography looks kind of okay, you know, and I think, but this just was painful to watch. Within the first five minutes, I'm like, I hate this. I hate this. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. at, like this is making me angry. I hate this so much. I think the acting is atrocious. The dialogue is atrocious. All of it is just I hated all of it. And, you know, if you, and I agree with a lot of what you're saying, Evan, about like pick a lane, but also like it feels in also in addition to the very juvenile humor, it feels like they kind of wanted to go the campy route. And the whole thing is, is it's so hard to do good camp intentionally and it can be done. Mm -hmm. But so often things that are campy, that are great, are not trying to be campy and they're really taking it seriously. And that's kind of the beauty of it. But this was just so tedious and so bad. It just made me mad. It pissed me off. Like I was so angry at the, while I was watching it and afterwards. <laughs> yeah. I, I think. Yeah. That's a great point, Megan, about the camp because yeah, it's something you can try for, but it's usually better when you're not. Right. <laughs> yeah. And I think the like the biggest mistake, and this is setting aside the juvenile humor and all that kind of stuff. The biggest mistake is having a bunch of non-actors have major, major roles in this movie because it's just like watching the guys in the Foo Fighters try to act. It's just like, I don't need to see, you know, Kiss in the Phantom of the Park or whatever the fucking Kiss movie from the 70s is called, you know? It's like, <laughs> like, like I said, Taylor Hawkins has kind of got some charisma, but I also just kind of like him because he's a drummer, you know, and I'm a drummer. But mm-hmm. like, and I like Pat Smear because he's goofy, you know? But the other guys in the Foo Fighters, who cares? Who cares about Nate right. Mendel? I don't care. Or K- Chris Shiflin. Mm-hmm. I don't like whatever. The Foo That's Fighters. Totally fair. I the, thought they all were bad, but yeah, the Foo <laughs> but, Fighters yeah. are Dave Grohl and Taylor Hawkins. All the other guys are interchangeable. 
So even <laughs> Pat Smear, who is um, is great and has a great career in punk music and as a side guitarist for lots of different bands, but he's not an actor, you know? I want to talk about that for a second because I think that's a really great point. But it, you saying it, Dave, it makes me think about other films where the, that are really fantastic with non-actors. Yeah. And I keep coming back to... Chloe Jaws films because Nomadland has so many non-actors in it. And um, I can't think, The Writer, her second film, also those were almost all non-actors, if not all non-actors. And those films are great and she gets great performances. And part of it is, I think, if you're going to use non-actors, it can be done and it can be done well. Yeah. But in order to get a good performance or good cr screen persona, you need to have a really fantastic director and also a really sharp editor. And it's very clear mm -hmm. that the director and editor on this are terrible. So that's, I think, also the problem. And in addition to the fact that they cannot act their way out of a paper bag, it's also that the directing and the editing are terrible. Yeah, well, the yes. director is primarily not a director. His his other mm -hmm. two his other two feature credits are, I think, one of the Hatchet movies. I don't remember which one. And uh, I looked this up the other day, and I can't remember. But um, he's largely like a camera operator and a DP. Um, yes, which is that's fine. You know, DPs can become good directors. Barry mm -hmm. Son Barry Sonnenfeld, arguably. But when you've got a screenplay like this, which is just to say, let's throw every horror trope at the wall and hope that it <laughs> sticks, you need somebody who's got the talent to direct non-actors. Yeah, Because I think that mm -hmm. what makes, say, Chloe Zhao work is, for example, um, she's putting non-actors in situations with which they are already familiar Yes, and so exactly. You, you would think that because the guys in Foo Fighters, the bulk of them have been in Foo Fighters since the second or third album, uh, which is around 2000, that they would have a better dynamic. And that's probably what they were counting on. But you need, I think that you need a steadier hand to pull that shit in. Like, this director has done a lot of Slayer uh, videos and things like that, and I'm sure has a lot of familiarity with uh, big camera moves because the you know music stuff, whether it's videos or shorts or whatever you want to call it, can be really expensive and have great camera work and really solid directors. Like a lot of gr of great film directors came from music videos and commercials mm -hmm. like Ridley Scott, commercial director. I mean, mm -hmm. there you go. David Fincher. David Fincher, yeah. yeah. I mean, rough start with Alien 3, but he found his footing. Um, well, there's also Zack Snyder who came from... There's also Zack Snyder who is <laughs> yes. like one of the worst directors who's ever had a long-standing career. So... <laughs> Um, but yes, but no, you're totally, totally right that there are directors who come from music video and commercials who are, who are brilliant. Yeah, and I think that what they should have done um, is one had someone else polish the screenplay and then they should have said, let's just have this one location because it's kind of cheap and the band is all executive producing it. So they're probably largely funding it. And let's just hire a fucking hot shit director and make that director, whoever it is, Chloe Zhao, David Fincher, whatever, have that person make us act, you know? Mm hmm. Yeah. Oh, well. It would have really helped. I mean, it certainly it, wouldn't I, I hurt. Could not agree more. <laughs> the, <laughs> the direct, the failure is not just in the writing; it is in the mm -hmm. directing and the editing, like you said, Megan. It's it, it's it fails on a lot of fronts, and <laughs> mm -hmm. I, you know, I think some of the creature design is creepy, like the the red eye thing, and like this the scene where he's like laying in bed and the creatures are coming from the clouds. Like, I think that was kind of interesting to me to watch and. Dave, you were saying that Dave Grohl has charisma, and I think he does. And I think I've enjoyed him in other, like I always think of him in Tenacious D in The Pick of Destiny when he's playing the devil in that climactic scene, and he's hilarious and awesome in that. Yeah, but this is just not the right. <laughs> it's not the, either not the right material for him, or it, it's just the direction is just so not there that the, he can't channel that charisma into anything yeah. well, useful. It's also mm -hmm. just because you really love horror, which he clearly does, doesn't mean you can write it. You know, exactly. Um, Thank you. So yeah, I think that's just. I don't know. It's 
I was really, I, I don't know what I was expecting. I just thought because I don't think the Foo Fighters are a great band, but I think that the, I, I like Dave Grohl. I think he's a good guitarist. Thinks he think he's an exceptional drummer, um, better than average rock vocalist, and one or two really good songs per album. If you took all 10 of the Foo Fighters albums, let's just say there are 10 because that's what they say in the movie, you would have a great double album. <laughs> so, you know, um, and this is a guy who I've seen Foo Fighters live, you know, but that's because they play the yeah, hits. Great show. Yeah. They, they put on a great show. They do. They play for hours and hours and hours and they are gr- fantastic. And they have great dynamics on stage and they have like weird cameo appearances. Like the guy who, when I saw them the last time, it was after Dave Grohl had fallen off the stage and broken his leg and he was doing the entire tour in a throne because he couldn't oh walk. Oh, my God. I and, can't believe you were that, that, that show. Wow. Yeah. And, he, and it was great. And they played the video <laughs> of him breaking his leg, which was hilarious because you can tell as he's falling off the stage that it's going to be a bad fall. But then they had his doctor who set his leg come out and sing one of their songs. I mean, <laughs> that's the kind of shit they do. And he was good, you know? So like, it's just, it's kind of like that they have all of this talent, but they just chose to use it in all the wrong ways in this. And also the other thing I wanted to mention is that the special effects were really hit or miss. Partly yes. because some of them were practical and some of them were CGI. And even though the practical effects weren't great, they're so much better than the CGI stuff that it was distracting. Like when the, the I can't remember what member of the band she was, but the one who gets the hammer in the head at the very beginning, that was oh, so... Oh, Jenna Ortega. Jenna Ortega, yeah. That was so gross. But it's because they were like smacking a watermelon with like food coloring on it or whatever it was. And then you've got like, you know, CGI blood, which never looks good. And CGI intestines never looks good. And, but then they were clearly filling an Edison light bulb with like fake blood. So that's practical. It's just like make up your mind, spend the money on the effects or don't, you know? <sighs> Okay, I've complained enough. <laughs> Anybody else? <laughs> yeah, I'm salty now just from dis- this discussion. <laughs> well, let's move on maybe to something hopefully better, question mark? Definitely better. Oh. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, I mean, it couldn't be worse. That's true. Um, I just have one more thing I wanted oh. to add in. This movie has an example of some of the worst blocking I've ever seen in a movie. Oh, let's hear it. <laughs> There's a scene where... What's his name? Pat's is it Pat Smear? He's the one he, who always sleeping. looks like he's about to smile. Yeah. Yeah. He's sleeping on the floor of the kitchen. And Leslie Grossman, who many people know from American Horror Story, is the realtor. And she sees in the kitchen a pair of legs on the floor and yep. a puddle of what looks like blood. And she walks towards it, finds that he's been sleeping in the kitchen, and he wakes up, and there's this horrible shot from like a weird angle around the counter (laughs) where you see her like stumbling over slash walking into the pile of blood almost and then like almost tripping on him while you say it's i've never seen such bad blocking in a movie and i don't understand why they blocked it that way i don't understand why the shot was from that perspective and uh, sorry it's just a weird thing to get riled up about but it was just i couldn't even believe it (laughs) well it's one of those things where everything is so awful that i think your awareness is heightened and, mm-hmm. and, and in my case, I was kind of like, I checked out, but it looks, sounds like you two were just like noticed every fucking thing that pissed you off. <laughs> so it doesn't surprise me that you would see that and be like, Arr! you know what I mean? Cause I mm-hmm. thought at first the idea that the house wasn't the Foo Fighters, there's six guys in Foo Fighters. So there's only five bedrooms. So Pat Smear is sleeping in the kitchen because one, it's the only thing available and two snacks. Okay, Sure. But then it just becomes like this running gag that's stupid, you know? And then I didn't notice her tripping over the blood and the, all the, you know, refuse. So I didn't have that same reaction that you did. But okay, that was Studio 666. Boo! Um, last movie of the night. It is better. It's Kimmy. It's Steven Soderbergh's new movie. It's written by David Kep. It stars Zoe Kravitz and um, Rita Wilson, I think. Wasn't that Rita Wilson? Yep. In in mm-hmm. the office, and um, some guy who I don't know who he is, and uh, who's a creep. 
<laughs> Are you talking about Jaime Camille? <laughs> uh, I'm talking about the guy at the very beginning who's who's like Oh, that guy. Okay, yeah. that's not Jaime Camille. Yeah, anyway, so this is uh let me give you the uh one sentence IMDb thing here. Uh, an agoraphobic Seattle tech worker uncovers evidence of a crime. Mostly true. Would would she <laughs> would we say she's agoraphobic? I mean, yes, yes. but no, right? Mm-hmm. Yes, I would say she's agoraphobic. Yeah. Cuz yeah. it's kind of would... it's kind of a convenient agoraphobia. You know what I mean? Do you mean it's convenient because it's not like she's necessarily for lack of a better word, born with it, but it's 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 induced by a traumatic event? No, I mean, it's kind of convenient that... Now, I don't really know too much about agoraphobia, but from what I understand, it's... I mean, she had to leave the house because of the trauma that she heard on the call. But at the same time, like, would, it, would she be able to just do that? I don't know. Um, but that's a little nitpicky, actually, because I kind of just felt like this is a pretty solid thriller. Um, yeah, I just want to jump in about the agoraphobia because I do know about agoraphobia. And not that I'm a doctor. Then let's, let's hear it then. Yeah, not that I'm a doctor or therapist by any means, so that disclaimer. But yeah, I'm just because you are agoraphobic or have agoraphobia doesn't mean you never leave. It means you're terrified to leave. So the fact that she's reworked her entire life to being solely at home. The fact that she won't go to the dentist, even though she needs a root canal yeah. and she's like angry about it and upset about it and, and anxious about it. Yeah. I mean, she clearly has agoraphobic tendencies, if not straight up agoraphobia, but yeah. So I think, it, I think it's interesting that, that the trauma and the crime happening is what spurs her, but it also makes sense because of it, what we learned does. about her. It does. I mean, it all kind of works, even though I still, I mean, what you're saying makes a lot of sense, Megan. Um, but anyway, let's just, I'll, Thank you. I'll give you a little more <laughs> plot. So there's this device that's like Alexa from Amazon. It's called Kimmy. And it's like one of those smart devices where you're like, Kimmy, play, um, what's the song that's really hot that everybody listens to in the movie? Um, oh, um, Billie Eilish's. Um, yeah, right. It's a Billie Eilish oxytocin. song. Oxytocin. That's the mm -hmm. one. You know, yep. Kimmy, play this. Kimmy, dim the lights. Kimmy, turn on the TV. Kimmy, mute the TV. Um, like all that kind of stuff. And what makes Kimmy unique, says the company, creepy, is that um, <laughs> Kimmy, A, doesn't listen to you unless you, she's programmed, she, I say she because her name's Kimmy and it has a woman's voice in the thing. But so let's just say the machine, Kimmy. You say, Kimmy, and then it says, I'm here. And then you tell it what to do. And when you're done telling it what to do, it stops recording. And what it does is instead of having an algorithm to analyze what you're saying, the company says, we have a huge uh, well of employees whose job it is to listen to you know, things that Kimmy got wrong, that our customers say Kimmy got wrong, and to identify the things that Kimmy got wrong, and then they will do manual corrections so that the next time somebody else asks for that, asks for that, it's more likely to be correct. Which just on the face of it sounds like a load of shit. But um, it is, that is true though. That is what they do. That's what Zoe Kravitz's job is. Her name is Angela Childs, by the way. And she listens to audio that the company has sent her of customers having a difficult time with Kimmy. And at one point, she's listening and there's a lot of loud music on this particular audio clip and she thinks she hears someone screaming. Isn't that what it is? Or she hears some banging and she hears someone screaming mm -hmm. and she knows a lot mm -hmm. about audio work. She's worked in audio a long time and she gets the file and she starts cleaning it, cleaning it up and she thinks she's heard a homicide, a premeditated homicide, um, which she has. <laughs> well, initially, I think she thinks that it's a sexual assault. Correct. Right. And That's right. By digging deeper, then she has reason to believe it's a homicide because then it's like clear that people came in and like killed this woman. Right. Yes. And as it, you know, you're thinking to your, because the movie does this clever thing where it shows the crime sort of as Angela might be imagining it as she's listening to the audio. But then you get the impression, oh no, she's probably just right because of course, 
she has to call somebody. She calls the company. She tells this, you know, there's all these things that, that, that you're not supposed to do with this audio. And Kimmy is about to have an IPO or the company is that owns it, um, which I can't remember the name of, but it means something. Uh, Amygdala. Amygdala, yeah. And she calls her boss at Amygdala and sends him the file. He's like, what are you doing sending me this file? Oh my God, you're crazy. D- just delete it. You never heard this. And his kids are going crazy in the background fighting and he loses it twice on them which, as a parent. If you've ever been on a Zoom call and your children are having a fight behind you, I'm just saying I sympathize. <laughs> so, um, so then Angela has this friend somewhere in Eastern Europe, this work friend, and she's like, how do you like hack a Kimmy? And he's like, do this, do this, do this, leave me out of it. She hacks the Kimmy that it came from. She gets some other audio files. And it turns out the woman who had this Kimmy was having an affair with this guy who, who's a big wig at the company who's going to benefit greatly from this IPO. And he's had her bumped off. Not Angela, but the woman he gave the Kimmy to. So then Angela calls Rita Wilson and... What's her name? Natalie Chowdhury? Is that mm-hmm. it? Mm-hmm. And she says, Rita Wilson says, come in to the office and we will listen to this and we will call the FBI. And so Angela has no reason to not believe that. So she, you know, leaves the apartment, even though she's terrified. And we should mention that the agoraphobia that she's experiencing, uh, you get the impression. She, she was assaulted. As she says, she was assaulted. And... Mm-hmm. I don't know if she killed her perpetrator or maimed him horribly or she defended herself in a way that she, she says she was put on trial for it, which I totally believe. Mm, and I didn't get the sense it was strictly a physical reason. I thought that possibly they just attacked her credibility as is often oh, the case that, when someone is sexually assaulted and then, then try to report it. That's fair. I didn't that's think about 100% that. 100% what I thought too. Okay, I didn't think I thought I thought that, you know, she defended herself physically and then she she got, you know, in legal trouble for it. That's what I thought. But But you know, I think either way it works because either way it's putting the victim slash survivor on trial. So either yeah. way it works. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the implication, of course, being that she was wronged. Yes. Um, and quite horribly. But anyway, so she has uh, suffered from agoraphobia since then. And I, she says that she was having some relief from it, either through talking to her psychologist or medication. I don't rem- She takes medication. It's not specific what the medication is. It doesn't really matter for the purposes of the screenplay. Um, but then she says COVID kind of like made her withdraw again. Um, and so she's been kind of stuck, you know, with the same, in the same place since COVID. And she's got this kind of sort of boyfriend who lives across the street. And there's this other guy who watches her. But anyway, back to the thing. She goes to the corporate office to talk to Natalie, Rita Wilson. And Rita Wilson's like, all right, let's listen to the, uh, audio recordings. And (laughs) Angel's like, uh, aren't you going to call the FBI? She's like, well. We should listen to him first before we call the FBI. I mean, come on. <laughs> so you see where this is going. So uh, Natalie's like, you know what? I'll go get the boss or whoever and we'll call the FBI and whatever. And Angela, how long does she wait in the office? Like 40 minutes? She's in there a long time because they do the whole thing where you mm-hmm. look at the clock a couple times. She gets up to use the restroom. And when she comes back, there's two guys running down the hallway to, a, to attack her. Um, to grab her. And so then, then it becomes this cat and mouse of her running through Seattle trying to escape them. And this, then the two creepiest things I think happen in this movie. One, she's abducted off the street oh. out, outside mm-hmm. of the FBI's um, Seattle branch office. That like, scene mm-hmm. is terrifying. Oh, so Fuck terrifying. The, I mean, I could... And you know what? I'll bet you that happens every day. So like, just fucking scary as shit and the one good thing about it is there are just enough people there who see it happen who are like trying to help her and she i can't does she pepper spray anybody during that scene or is that i can't remember she kicks her way out she and kicks people she kicks her way out protest drag her out of the van yeah. and help her and then she just like takes off and um there's this kind of interesting moment where she she's you know she's got she's wearing like um 
She's wearing some clothes. She's got, it has a hood anyway. And she walks past these two cops by a subway station. And I thought she's going to get hassled because she's wearing a hood. And no, red herring. Um, But then even scarier, she's standing outside some office building. And this woman walks up to her and says, hey, I thought we were going to meet you at, somebody bumps her with an umbrella. And then this woman says, hey, I thought we were going to meet you at whatever. And then the same two guys from the van are standing right there. And the person with the umbrella has like drugged her in some way, like shot her with something, who knows what. Mm -hmm. And she sort of collapses and the woman and these two dudes pick her up and carry her off. And it's just like, that's even scarier than being abducted straight off the street because that's like crazy coordinated evil. Um and then the rest of it is, you know, they take her back to her apartment. They're going to try to kill her. And then she comes out of the stupor from the drugs and she just kills everybody. And the guy across the street who also has some form of agoraphobia sees that she's outside her home. And he's like, wait a minute, red flag. Why are you outside your home? And he goes over to help her, which, by the way, he figures that out really quickly. And then he gets stabbed and then she kills a bunch of people with a nail gun. Side plot, there's, a, there's an apartment or a loft being like rehabbed above her so she goes up and gets a nail gun and shoots a bunch of guys with nails which i don't know i think they may have gotten off a little easy but um <laughs> oh but the one thing i want to say awesome. it was the one thing i want to say though about that um about her killing before she kills everybody and before you like and before the guy comes in being stabbed the her neighbor she thinks she's safe in her apartment while one of the guys is pounding on the door. And then there's right. somebody standing in the dark who grabs her. So it's right. like more yeah. terrifying moments. Yeah. I forgot about that. Fucking I man. forgot he was in there already. Yeah. yeah. That's Jaime Camille. <laughs> Whom I love. Anyway, not in this movie. Well, he's great, but anyway. <laughs> yeah. And so then there's a good, you know, five, 10 minute sequence of, let's just call it cat and mouse in the apartment and um and Angela's clever man she's smart yes and she one of the perps as luck would have it wears glasses and so she she does this she she gets a plan to like knock his glasses off his face which she does she runs to the back of her apartment she goes up through the um into the attic into the crawl space and she gets into the apartment that's being renovated finds a nail gun and is like, aha, a nail gun. And then she goes back to the trap door and waits for one of the guys to try to get up and just nail guns him in the forehead. And I was like, you know, I kind of wish you got two nail guns in the forehead, but okay. <laughs> one, yeah. well, one, one will do enough it. enough right between the eyes that took, to, took down the giant, like the, the big guy yeah. of the three of mm -hmm. them. And then she just demolishes the rest of them. And I love that she doesn't fuck around. She's like, I'm going to just make sure everybody's dead here. Yeah. That's been attacking me. Like she puts several nails into the lead guy, including a like finisher. Yeah. <laughs> and I love there. her nine one one call where yes. she, where she says, my name is Angela Childs. I live at blah. Uh, I just, I, there was a home invasion. There are three dead bodies and someone here who's been stabbed and needs medical attention immediately. <laughs> and you're yep. like, how matter of fact. <laughs> so great. Um, I loved this film so much. I had a great time with it. I mean, I also love in typical, when, when I feel like when Soderbergh's firing on all thrusters, his movies are short and to the point. And this movie is that, you know? It's 89 minutes mm -hmm. and it's a quick 89 minutes, you know? Yeah, it's taut. It, it is, it's a really great thriller. It's tight. It tells a really interesting story. I mean, I think right now too, the the big tech industry, it's like, I described it as like Hitchcock meets big tech because it really has that like Hitchcockian kind of like thriller aspect to it. But we've got this like really modern story about corruption and in the tech industry and i think that makes for just a really compelling story but it's also just so well done like great cinematography great mm -hmm. editing it's so fucking all by tense. steven soderbergh the by the way yeah mm -hmm. the whole last act is just so fucking tense and terrifying between the midday abduction the tranquilizer umbrella her being in the car being semi-conscious hearing them plot to arrange her death and <laughs> her using Kimmy to escape 
to, you know, get the nail gun and then take care of these guys. And then I love that we get to see even just a couple minutes of, you know, after this, you know, seeing that Angela has been able to kind of get her life back, you know, on, you know, she's able to go back outside again and have, you know, uh, you know, regular interactions with people again, and that she was able to, in both conquering these enemies also kind of like gain her confidence back. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, Go Everything ahead, you're saying, Evan, I completely agree with. I mean, I love, and it's interesting, Dave, when you talk about Soderberg, Soderberg when he's firing on all c- cylinders. I always love him. I never think he's not firing on yeah. all thrusters. I'm always on board for Soderberg. I think he's brilliant. I love his work in film and TV. Love it. And I agree. Incredible cinematography and editing. Because again, it's Soderbergh. So of course it's going to be amazing. But yeah, this was mm-hmm. so incredibly tense and terrifying and pulse pounding. It was so and it was funny. I saw your post. I did I didn't read much about it, but I did see you post on social media, Evan, the, the last you're like, I'm still thinking about the last 20 minutes and my heart's pounding. And yeah. I was like, oh boy. And yeah, I mean, I think it starts even sooner than that. But yeah, the last 20 minutes is just brutal in the best possible way. And you know what's interesting about this film. First of all, I think Zoe Kravitz is such a great actress and I think she's so good here. She really anchors the film. I mean, it's a, it's an incredibly well-crafted film, but she really anchors it and I think she's so good. But this is a story that's, you know, been told before sort of, you know, it's it's very like you said Hitchcockian, and it's very rear window, very the conversation, very blow up and blow out. Yeah. And but yet it's doing things in such an intriguing and compelling way, especially by updating it to modern times. I mean, those films were modern at their times too, but updating it with the, you know, intrusive technology that yes, helps, but is also so intrusive and, you know, dealing in surveillance and whatnot, which is, you know, awful and terrifying, but also helps us out sort of in so many ways. Mm. But yeah, but I think it's just really great. And the other interesting thing is that those films are so like all the films I mentioned, they are male protagonists. So to have a woman protagonist who is at the core of this is really great. I mean, yes, we got the net and that was Sandra Bullock, but that's a terrible movie. But anyway, I digress. But <laughs> <laughs> I like I digress. that. But yeah, I mean, I don't get me wrong. I do enjoy that movie, even though it's not great. <laughs> but what I also really love about this is that there's such great world building and character development right away. Like in the first five minutes, we're in her apartment and we know everything about her, really. I mean, we might not know that she was assaulted and things like that, but we know, okay, she's terrified to leave her apartment. Okay, yes, this is during COVID because we see masks outside because she looks out her window a lot, but also she's terrified because she's constantly using um, hand sanitizer in her own home. And she, it's not like she typically lets people in to her home. So yeah, so it's just like we get all these great touches of who she is as a person. And I I love that kind of visual world building storytelling. It's just great. So I just, I also had a blast with this. This was so intense, so much fun, so enjoyable. I loved every single moment. Well, I, I don't have much to add. Um, (laughs) two things. I I have never been what you would call a Zoe Kravitz fan, but the, her more recent work, I'm just like, you know, she's got something like Mm -hmm. she's, cause she's really good in this. I'll be interested to see the Batman and how she does with Selena Kyle. Um, I bet you it won't be boring if, but, uh, and the other thing I just wanted to say about, um, Soderbergh is, uh, yeah, Megan, um, I like that you like that when he's firing on all thrusters, et cetera, you always think he's great. Um, What I think is interesting about him is he's, I I sort of think about him as like the the consummate filmmaker. He's like such a fucking pro at this point. He's made so many movies. He's shot so many movies. He's edited so many movies. He can just fucking do it. Mm -hmm. And he's so good at it that even if the screenplay is not great, and I think this is a pretty good screenplay, he can still pull it off. It's not going to mm-hmm. be, it's probably not going to be boring when, I mean, I think mm-hmm. that's why he does some of the more experimental stuff that he does. But the, like, since he came back from his quote, retirement, unquote, he's made a lot of good movies. Logan Lucky, Unsane. Um, I, I didn't think that the gangster movie that was, that he did last year was so great, but it wasn't bad. You know, it was just another one of those, like he's firing on all thrusters. So like it works. 
Um, so firing on all thrusters, which I'm pretty sure is what Dr. McCoy says in Star Trek IV. <laughs> I think that's where I got it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's why I jumped on that bandwagon of that metaphor because... Yeah. Yeah, I think, Gotta love yeah. Star Trek. <laughs> I think that McCoy says it's about Spock. He's like, I don't know if you've noticed, but he's not exactly firing on all thrusters. <laughs> he does. I think he has said that more than once. <laughs> yeah. So anyways, but, <laughs> so, uh, go ahead, Megan. Sorry, I was just going to say, yeah, I completely agree with you about Soderbergh being the consummate professional. And it's very difficult to make a great film out of a shitty screenplay. And I 100% believe he has that capability because he's just so technically proficient and amazing in so many ways. And as far as Zoe Kravitz goes, if you want to see her in a really phenomenal performance, great film too, Yelling to the Sky, she's amazing. Okay, I will definitely check that out. Yelling to the sky! I will check that out. Uh, do we have any closing thoughts on Kimmy? Oh, the bad guy. The, the, other, the other guy, the IPO, big swinging VP of whatever, he does get arrested at the end, just in case. Yay! Yep, yeah, that he does. So, any, any final yeah. thoughts on Kimmy? That it's fucking awesome and you should see it. <laughs> I have one minor final thought because I keep talking about him because I love him so much. Jaime Camille, it's so weird to see him in a villainous role because he is amazing as Rogelio in Jane the Virgin and he is just so charming and so lovely. That's and lovable. what he's from. Yes. And I mean, I've seen him in other things, but I've never seen him as a, as a cutthroat, ruthless villain. And it's such a change of pace, but he's, I still really enjoyed him in it. So in addition to loving Zoe Kravitz in this film, I, I really enjoyed him too. Well, cool. All right, then. Yeah, that's this episode of Spoiler Peace Theater. Let's recap right quick. Hellbender comes out. It's out on Shudder right now. I think we have three yays. Yay? Yes, yes. <laughs> Hell yay. <laughs> <laughs> um, Studio 666, which is coming out in theaters and I think on demand. I'm pretty sure that's three nays. Hell nay. <laughs> My God, no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, boy. And Kimmy is out on HBO Max right now, and I think we got three yays. Yes. Right? Yeah, okay. Just I'm here for it. I just wanted it's you to so both good. confirm. <laughs> okay, so that's Spoiler Peace Stater. Thank you very much, everybody, for tuning in. As always, want to give a big shout out to our editor, Otto Klammer. Thank you, Otto, for doing the heavy lifting each week and making us sound great. Thanks, Otto. With a Glaswegian, Thanks, Otto. With a Glaswegian accent there. Um, you can find Spoiler Peace Theater <laughs> anywhere you get podcasts. You can find us at our website, spo web spite? website, spoilerpeace.com. <laughs> it's late at night, folks. You can find us on the social meds. We're Spoiler Peace Theater on Facebook, at Spoiler Peace on Twitter, Instagram, and Letterboxd. If you'd like to get in touch with us, please send us an email, spoilerpeace at gmail.com. Tell us that Studio 666, we're overlooking its mastery. Don't tell us that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> or if you wanted to leave us a voicemail, you could give us a call. 86221Peace. Leave us a voicemail, not about Studio 666, but something else. <laughs> and if you like the show, please rate and review us by going to ratethispodcast.com slash spoiler piece. You can also rate us on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. And that helps us out a lot if you do that, especially with the good ratings. Wink, wink. So uh, please do that if you can. <laughs> and if you really, really like the show, please consider joining our Patreon. This week, uh, it was the result of our February poll. Uh, we had movies featuring largely black casts for Black History Month. The Patrons chose Love and Basketball out of five movies. We had a great, lively discussion about it. And for just $5 a month, you too can become a patron and get all the extra audio and goodies and vote in the polls and things like that. And so, um, yeah, it's patreon.com slash spoiler piece. And thank you very much, patrons. So anyway, my name is Dave Riedel. I write about movies. I'm a member of the Boston Online Film Critics Association, and you can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Letterboxd at Dave Sees Movies. My name is Evan Crean. I'm co-chair of the Boston Online Film Critics Association and co-author of your 80s movie guide to better living. You can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Letterboxd as Real Recon. That's real as in film real. And I also just wanted to say a, a shout out or thank you to our newest patron. Oh, so right. Thank you, uh, Gabby Gale Montgomery, for becoming a patron. Thank you. Thank you. And my name is Megan Kearns. 
You can find my film reviews at Edge Media Network. I, too, am a member of the Boston Online Film Critics Association. You can follow me on Twitter at OpinionSWorld or on Instagram and Letterboxd at TheOpinionS. We'll see you next week, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye.